Greetings, Warlords Raj here. Welcome to Saga Thursday, the show all about the skirmish miniatures game from Studio Tomahawk. We got another monthly episode with our good friend Monty. Monty, how's it going? Excellent, Raj. How about yourself? Oh, I am good. So we are recording this a couple weeks after Fimble Winter, and we uh it's all it's already crunch time for Adepticon, gosh darn it. Yes, it is. <laughs> So, um, Monty, do you got any last minute painting to do? Uh, a little bit, but I'm probably not allowed to reveal it. <laughs> okay, yeah. Well, let's, uh, let's jump to it. The main topic here will be the Fimble Winter tournament recap. We both had games in there, and Monty did quite well. But before we get to that, I do want to mention a couple things. So... Uh, Elderman Andrews over on Discord, he set up a few different surveys, and one of them is the Saga Event Rolling Survey, and he's compiling data, Monty. Are you a data man? Nice. Monty, I do like man, data. I really do. Numbers. All right. So he's uh, gathering this information. He's, he's crunching numbers. He's doing stuff. He's looking for trends and stuff like that, you know, power levels and everything like that. So head on over to the Discord if you played an event recently or you're a TO. So I gave him all the Fimble Winner information and uh, he seemed to enjoy that. So the more info he has, the more juicy tidbits can be revealed in the data, Monty. So nice. the links to this one, he's got a, a couple of different surveys there. I can't remember offhand all of them, but they are linked on the Saga Thursday Discord server, which is uh, linked below. Uh, moving on, like I said, Adepticon is coming up here. So they've officially closed the online registration. I think you can do in-person, on-site. All of the Saga events have, a, have some room. We're looking to be, this is gonna be the biggest year since, I don't know when, Monty, at least, since uh, post-COVID, the, okay. the last two we've had. So two of the events are about the same. Two of the other ones are significantly larger. I'm trying to think back to 2019. I know my Thursday event had like maybe 20-some people. Right. And so my Thursday event this year has over 30 people. So nice. I, I think it's better than, than 2019. Wow. And uh, we could squeeze in a few more. That Vikings event, it's on Sunday. It's on the weekend. You don't have to come for the whole kit and caboodle. You can just come and play Vikings with us, right, Monty? Yes, that would be awesome. Yeah, so you and I, we are teamed up again. We've got a secret project. Yep. You're working hard on models. I promised months ago I would work hard on a <laughs> display board. And now I am uh, come due, so I will uh -oh. be doing that. Rest assured, buddy, to get that display board. Just like I said I would, I've got... Basically a whole army I'm working on, and I was pretty nervous. This is a new top secret army. Won't be revealing any photos or anything beforehand. Okay. Not even telling my good buddy Monty. Yeah. This is gonna. No idea. This is gonna blow the foundations off the saga world, Monty. Right. <laughs> no. Uh, this is an army I've had for a while, and Adepticon is always a good motivator. And I had them assembled and. This will probably be the fastest army I've ever painted. I, last Thursday, mm -hmm. I started painting six guys. Or no, last Wednesday. And then on Thursday, all six of them were done, including basing. Wow. So that's, that's like a world record for me. Yeah. So they're, they're coming along nicely. So if they weren't, I would be pretty panicked. Uh, and then I've got some stupid old models that <laughs> have been waiting to be assembled for a while. They're still... I'm looking... I'm just looking at them right now on the desk. I thought leaving them out would give me the motivation, but I don't know. It seems to be lowering motivation the more <laughs> I look at it. <laughs> so um, got got a mix here. I'm high on the new army. I'm actually, I, I think the display board stuff uh, will be really cool. Looking forward to that. It's just a couple old models to fill out the existing armies, and it's going to be good. Monty, I think you and I are on a team of some kind yes we are t-dog terry he asked me and i agreed to sign up i didn't look at it too closely because i thought i'm not playing all four days because i'm running one of the days so oh, i assumed right. 
you know, I would be ineligible or something. But I think that's factored in. Do you know who's all on on the team here? Uh, so far, I know it's uh, you, me, and Terry. I think okay. there's a fourth, but I don't know who it is. Okay. Kind of a roving, we're a roving, uh, we're a roving band. Yeah, we're a little, a little mix. Yeah. So Illinois, Wisconsin, Minnesota. So it has to be another state. Mm -hmm. I think it has I to think be. I think so. Give the uh, symmetry of everything. So looking forward to that. You know, when this episode comes out, it's basically two weeks. You know, the after the the crusade events will be going. So looking looking forward to it. It's going to be awesome. Is it going to be better than next than last year? Uh, I don't know that it can. Right? I don't know that it can. And we keep topping ourselves. We will try. We'll sure try. So looking forward to it. All right. That's in the future. Let us discuss the past. <laughs> the <laughs> Bimble Winter Crusader Kings yes. 2024. So this was a couple of weeks ago. I got to play in this. Monty, you got to play in this. Yep. This was a whole bucket of fun. Tournament pack will be linked below, but this is going to be the results show. We haven't done a recap for some time. Now, Monty, I've got a picture of your beautiful Mutatawea warriors up here. It's going to pop over to the command group, the hearth guard, the camels. Not shown here are some cavalry models. Right. As well, you went whole hog. I'm looking back. I don't see him in this other photo. So, Mutatawea, we know, Monty, you've got a long and sordid history. <laughs> it's true. With this warband. It is true. So, uh, why? Now, this is a new warband. Yep. I can't remember if we talked about it or not, but you painted them fresh. I believe you yeah. had something else. You had a couple of pokers in the fire, as I recall. Right. Is that correct? It is. I um, I started down the road of painting up uh, Knights of St. Lazarus, and I had 16 of those guys painted. But then I never kind of I kind of got distracted by the mutts. I love the artisan figures. I had an idea in mind for like a scheme and a way to like make this kind of ragtag bunch look a little more unified and kind of repeat certain colors. And I did a few test models and I was just so happy with the results that I was off to the races. And um, I did a few test games and tabletop simulator, um, kind of like just, you know, I played them enough that like I could jump right back into them, kind of tweak my style. And then that they ended up being the one that I landed on. I'm like, these are the guys that I'm gonna take. Awesome, yeah, I agree. Lovely, lovely figs. Fifth times. Charm, a charm. Monty. Yep. Uh, are you still holding fast to I keeping this army? I, I don't want to do a sixth, seventh, eight version. This one, this is getting a little silly even by my standards. So I'm going to hold on to them. And I'm, I've kind of painted them up already kind of in a way that I plan to use them for um, other, you know, the two other Arab factions. I'll need yeah. some composite bow. But uh, this is a very good basis for running any of the Arab factions. Yeah, you need <laughs> you need quite a few models for each one of those. Um, but the the basis of warriors on foot yep. will never never get old. Exactly. Those. So got the solid foundation there. So yeah, that's awesome. So what was your con configuration here for? Four points of warriors. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, I I love um, the warrior heavy builds, um, so I did do that. Uh, four points of warriors, two points of hearth guard in a magical land. Um, it might have been nice to do a half point swap to maybe, depending on the scenario and your opponent, maybe do a six pack of hearth guard. But we were our lists were locked, so I went with just straight up uh, two points of hearth guard and four warriors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you still had some some options there in equipment yes, yes so I do. you had the uh warrior archers yes know, much maligned but right i believe they found their place by yes, the end they did actually and yes. you had the three different versions of the, the hearth guard so right uh that was pretty cool to see i took the pagan raiders so same old Heathen models. Uh, you can see those in this. I got a pick a picture of the cover image of that video, but the Heathen Army show and tell. You can see pictures of those. So I was using the Pagan Raiders, back of the book, old friends, new enemies. 
and I used three points of sailors, so they have to be in units of eight. I used one point of hearth guard, they have to have heavy weapons. The Warlord has to have a heavy weapon, and I had two points of warriors, and they could only have javelins, so I would split them into a seven and a nine. So that was figuration is pretty much locked in. There's no mm -hmm. no options there, and that was. Uh, Kind of one of the reasons for doing crusades, just to be able to use the, these pagan raiders. So uh, I was looking forward to it. Monty, you came down a day early. We actually got in a game, you and me. We did. It was at awesome. At the hobby shop, a little secret battle beforehand. The mutts versus yep. the pagan raiders. And using that Saxon board, I always felt it's kind of just another version of the moot Tatawea. So uh, similarly aggressively aligned. This picture, there's no terrain. We just did the Battle of Heroes, drew some cards, and went to town. This was a little bit of a bit of a slobber knocker here, wouldn't you say, Monty? Uh, it was an eye opener for me. Oh, okay. In a couple ways. So, in, in what in what way? Uh, well, first of all, just, if you had asked me, um, Monty, what warband are you guessing Raj is bringing? I was telling everyone the Eastern princess. So I was, so as you took your models out of the box, I was a little disappointed to have been yeah. so wrong. I, I swear I've mentioned pagan raiders like a dozen <laughs> was it times. To, was it to your wife? Nah, <laughs> In someone, your dreams? I need a fan to go back. Yeah, right. Listen to previous Thor's days. <laughs> uh, I can see how you would be because I was using the Eastern princes and continue right. to do so in right. the Fimble Winter campaign against right. Zach. So that... That campaign is kind of getting the princes out of my system, so I don't really <laughs> want to use the raiders here. Um, I, I would have run, yeah, after playing in that campaign, yeah, I, I would try it again with the, yeah. the princes. I think I agree. Fine. Same. Um, so, yeah, this one was a good game, as I recall. Came down to the last couple rows, just sort of edged you out, as I recall. Is that correct, Monty? Can set the record straight uh, that, that weekend is a blur. I do remember feeling like number one, like holy hell, I need to puzzle this out better. Um, the very first time I sent uh, sent in my boys, loaded up board. Um, you played death is nothing, and I think the math was I did twelve hits on you, and you did twelve hits on me, and I was yeah. like, ooh, that that's not what nothing. I wanted. I didn't want twelve hits on me. Yeah, that ended up being a clutch play throughout mm -hmm. the, the weekend here. Well, it was we'll bad. Get into that a little bit more. Um, yeah, I can not really remember almost anything about this game, <laughs> um, but uh, I know it came down to the very end, and we didn't get an extra turn or something like that. So, could have been different, but uh, good. Always good to get in a game yeah. against Imani. Yeah. So round one, we are playing the three sages scenario, just mm -hmm. a variation of ambush. Yep. Uh, one thing is you can't shoot them out. You're trying to capture the little buggers. You get a point for being the one who captures them. And if you hold them at the end of the game, you get three points. And there was a dice cap at the end of the game which was important for, for our game. And I don't know if this, I'll be curious to see how it impacted or didn't impact your games throughout the day. I think most of the scenarios had this, but on the, if it went to a six turn, which this one did, the first player was limited to five dice and the second player, the guy going last was limited to three dice. So it was very difficult to wait until the last turn to grab an objective. You know, you only had three saga dice to try and do something with. So, Monty, um, why don't you go for it? We're looking at a picture of my game. We managed to take one game picture between us for there the you go. weekend. But, right. Uh, why don't you go first? Uh, how did who were you playing? How did how did it go? Right. So my first game, I was playing Terry, uh, Terry D. And you know, all these events that we've been at before, we've never played each other. So uh, when I saw that we'd drawn each other, it was very exciting. I would also say it was a little bit made me nervous because he was running Spanish and I know enough about Spanish. They've got their uh, tricksy play where I think if they get the dice right, they can dump two to three fatigue on one unit uh, with the right dice in one round. And that's pretty I don't really have a way to clean up on that. <clears throat> and I don't other than fanaticism, I can be a little exposed on shooting, but 
Um, as this game kind of unfolded, the first turn, Terry was player one. Um, he came out kind of aggressively, did a uh, Hinate's where he's running around and shoot me up with uh, like my armor drops by one. Mm -hmm. And I was making all my saves. In his very last round, he found an angle to put um, his shots on my camel riding warlord, which made me sweat. That could have been a disaster. And I made all my saves. I was like, and that's kind of the tale. That first turn, I really did have the dice. I did have the luck. And over time, repeatedly, right? Like my guys get up a mm -hmm. little bit, then a little more, then a little more, then a little, little more. And so... Um, we did we did pull away, uh, but I also feel like I used up too much of my good dice in one game. So oh, no, <laughs> no, that'll happen. The I dice. wanted to space it out, but mm -hmm. absolutely. Oh, that's interesting. Did you uh, either? Did you get all three objectives per chance? We or? did not. So it was kind of crazy the way the uh, sages were behaving. My sage, uh, the guy in the stripes that you'll see, um, waving a library book to the heavens. He was closest to Terry's side, and we hammered that guy time and time again. <laughs> I hammered him when he was fully exhausted after Terry couldn't quite take him down. And I even used, I think I used at least a play on my board, and I couldn't drop him. And at the end of the game, he literally zips to the end of the table, fatigue free. He's like, I'm out of here. <laughs> it's like, that's impossible. How did that just happen? It wasn't for a lack of trying. Oh, that's awesome. It's funny. Yeah, dude, our sages. So I was playing Brent with Byzantines. You know, the picture up is a picture of our game. My troops are on the bottom. His are on top. And those sages were, they were some nasty brothers, man. <laughs> so he, he had to hit his twice, the one closest to him. And he had extra defense dice, whatever, rerolls, everything going on. I killed one the first time. And I think I killed two the second time. These are just levy models. But for survival points, they went from 10. So like they're worth four. You know, if you kill one, they go down to three. So each time they killed was like a point. Okay. Um, and then on my side, uh, I ended up grabbing two of them. And they were, I had to hit them like five. I mean, I was throwing everything wow. at them five times, just like you. They killed... Uh, at the end, I had like two units of four. <laughs> like they, they like wiped out two units like effectively. Um, and, and they killed so many that the bonus points, you know, I had two objectives. He had one, but they had killed so many of my warriors that the margin was just three points between us, and, you know, assuming I could hold it till the end of the game. And at the time, I thought, I was just thinking three points was like a draw range, you know, a draw is a one or a two. So um yeah i was playing as if it was like a draw situation now brent he kind of got stuck with his cab behind a field he's very we know he's a very cautious fellow monty so um he wasn't really making a move he spent quite a few turns just posturing and um i will say so i was running the event and playing in it so i kind of had a weird uh, perspective in all my games where I was okay just like kind of not doing anything because it meant the game was going to be over quicker right and I could get to you know gathering the the score she's getting yeah. everything entered in so I really wasn't you know pushing anything if I didn't feel like I, I needed to game wise so against Brent here yeah I was fine just kind of looking at each other uh, there was a little swamp in the bottom left I was kind of playing with running out throw a javelin or two come back and so I begged, I think, one or two hearth guard to push it up to uh, a solid win uh, condition. And so on his last turn, Brent is like, well, I got to try to push this back. So he had, you know, we're posturing with Byzantines. So he had everything had like rares on it. You know, there's like eight, <laughs> six, seven rares on his board. Yep. So he ended up pulling them all back. And he's going to try to load up his composite bow warriors. And then so once I saw that, when I did my vivacity play to uh, move some guys, you know, all game I've been doing defensive retreats. And so once he loaded up like warrior activations, uh, I went the opposite way. You know, I just went forward to try and get in range of something on the last turn. And he ended up uh, just trying to skirt off as best he could. And it ended up being a, a, a victory for the pagan raiders wow. in the end so close. um yeah it was just a very very close game not not much got killed 
in that one. Uh, just a couple hearth guard, some levy. Uh, last turn I did do kind of a big charge just to try to kill some stuff, get some numbers, mm -hmm. but um, just kind of barely came out ahead in the end. So that was my game one. So went pretty quick. Game two. Wish we had a pick because Monty, it was you and me. Yes, yes, it was. I did not want to face the Raj this early in the event. <laughs> and this was one I had done no prep for because you can't tell it will be what it will be. Yeah, so this was is funny because last year I played a game before the event and I played uh, I think Dylan and we our test game was game five. I ended up playing Dylan in the event in game five in the exact scenario, you know, with the same armies. <laughs> so you and I we had tested game two and right. we were playing in game two so that's funny now the cards were were slightly different here now Monty, you had you were part of the muslim team so you had an impact over the special objectives and three of you were mutt players and the fourth was saracens chris and so there's three special objectives that could have been drawn one was get to the other side of the table one was kill 10 or more models in a single turn. And then one was get 75% of your army killed. So we thought for sure you guys would be choosing, choosing get 75% of your army killed. Nah. Now what, there was a little discussion there. I, why didn't you guys, uh, why did you guys eliminate that one? Why didn't you want to get that one? Right. So, so a couple things. Um, number one, you know, almost every time I've seen a player pick this, they somehow still can't meet it. Like 75% It's pretty hard to do, yeah. It's really hard to do. Even if you're a Viking and you're playing aggressively or a Mutt player playing aggressively. And I should also say, like, a big change in how I was running Mutts for this weekend was to try to kill my guys more judiciously and try to use my abilities where I drop my own army armor more judiciously. So I'm, I'm trying to keep them alive. I just didn't want to do that one. I didn't think even if I was trying, if I could necessarily hit it. So mm -hmm. that was me. Okay. Okay. Well, for the scenario, the cards were, were different, like I said. So the special objective was to, I believe, get to the other side of the table. And that kind of actually worked really well mm -hmm. with the battle for hero cards that got drawn. So the special victory point condition was survival points. So there's two survival point missions in a row. And then this one was if you get to the corners, each unit in the corner scores two bonus points at the end of the game. So that's pretty big. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one, it could be one, you know, just one model left. If he can get there, he can score that two bonus points. Right. And the, there was no special rules. The terrain was, was pretty wild. So one player got to put down four pieces and there was some weird little tiny restrictions that didn't really stop you from doing whatever the heck you wanted. And then the um, one guy started with four dice and the other player got to do everything, I think. Um, so we we didn't really think twice about anything. We just, we didn't bid nothing. We just nah, rolled off and I got rolled. to be the one who put down all the terrain. So oh, yeah. put a giant... Uneven hill, I believe, in the middle Steep of your deployment hill, right zone. in the middle of my back line. So then, I now like am, yep, I'm now split in half. Field on one side, too, so there's less room, and then a little swamp with a little channel coming yep. down one side. So. Yep. Um, so I was hosed, and I did say to you in the moment, I go, so what do I do with this terrain deployment? And you're like, nothing. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, you were pretty basically hemmed into yeah. like a little quarter of the table and how did the how did the game develop um not really well not really well from the very beginning because like you said if you can imagine um you're playing saga you have a wide open you're centrally located you've got lateral lines you can go left you could go right stand up sit down fight 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 meanwhile i'm squeezed into a corner and then I have a swamp in front of me. So as I try to come out of my corner, I don't have lateral lines and I don't have forward lines. I either have to veer left or right. 
And um, there's not even really enough room, like for my whole army to, pr to proceed as a whole. So I kind of threw two kind of tokenish units on my right flank to kind of hold and pin. And then the rest of my army uh, shifted to the left and was trying to come up through a channel. But it was just not good. I knew if I tried to come out of those two channels and fight you, you'd jump on one wing or the other and wreck me. Um, I just didn't like, I didn't like my position. I didn't like my odds. I didn't like it. <laughs> yeah, so what kind of happened was you kind of fed me a unit to kind of distract my boys and ended up getting two or three charges on it, yep. wiping it out. And you were kind of moving down the table, shooting for that corner. Yeah. And mass, and that was kind of your goal here. And it'd be up to me to kind of kind of stop you, but um, it almost worked because if I was playing a different faction, I think that could have worked. Because at first, I didn't read that special rule about scoring the corners correctly. I thought it was if you have a unit, you will score two, but it's two per. So I didn't really I didn't realize that till the third turn. So if I was playing you know, <laughs> Anglo Danes or Norse Gales or something, you know, I would have been out of contention. But the Saxons had the speed with the ability vivacity. Monty's right. favorite. I do like vivacity. Against. Yeah, that was like the number one ability for the entire tournament. Um, just being able to redeploy those two units, holy smokes, was such clutch basically every turn of every game. That was where the first horse went. So I was able to... I didn't really have to stop you. I had enough units I could match you, and I had the speed to get there. So I was like, well, you know, if he's going to go, I'm just going to go. Mm -hmm. I've already killed this one unit. I'm up yep. a little bit. Yep. And now it's it's on to Monty to try to make something happen. And so you kind of, you know, we saw that if, if everything just continued, you weren't, you weren't going to win, you know. So you had to come back and try to make a play. And so it started off pretty pretty decent okay the, the yeah. first the very first part of the attack you bag two two of the heavy weapon hearth guard with the uh ala akbar so that's like the dream target right there and i right. was a little sloppy and you came in you could have done it two or three times the first time you killed two the second one was nothing nothing and then i think that third one that third die just sat there yeah. um, you did a few charges you had a, actually a brilliant yeah, I actually think it kind of came down to dice because you wiped out that eight pack that was guarding everything, and then you had a chance to take out that last hearth guard. There was a unit of two, I think, maybe one, but couldn't quite get no. the hits through to wipe it out. So Could if not. you had popped that last hearth guard, you know, that's like a two point swing right there, plus one, two fatigues, maybe a third fatigue on another unit. So if I'm trying to make a run now, you know, when you're trying to do stuff, having these fatigues and Things being canceled and stuff is a real pain in the neck. So I think if the dice were slightly different, I, we definitely could have been in draw territory. But as it was, the attack kind of faltered. I wiped up this the stuff you brought back with the warlord and got my stuff to the corner to counter your stuff in the corner. So it ended up being another victory for the pagan raiders. But um, it was like another interesting game where there wasn't necessarily a lot of combat like i was okay again you know if we weren't going to fight that's yep. that's fine you know i'll just move along take my points um i gotta get to running the event anyway so it's right. just another if, interesting game if if i can offer up this from the other perspective mm -hmm. if you're gonna if you're gonna put a hook in the water you should put some bait on it by jamming me in the corner like that i literally had lost all hope and my plan was to play for a tie like i just figured mm -hmm. I, I could fight you in a tunnel that's i'm trying to squeeze my units to a tunnel i'm like that's not a winning strategy um i can't go right i can't go left so i i started just like i'm gonna just have to play for a tie i like i couldn't see any other way and i would also say just one other small thing mm -hmm. was um in our practice game when I threw the haymaker at you and got like 12 hits on you and you bounced four back to me with death is nothing. Um, I knew that like when I go to do a haymaker and you had a rare up on death is nothing that like mm -hmm. you were flattening out like my best play. I'm going to trade units and you don't normally win saga by trading units. 
you could trade key units, but you really want the other guy to lose his unit and you to keep yours. And I also yeah, you can, I, right you trade once exactly to set up another trade that's right. uh, you know that's not a trade that's just taking you know exactly so it was it was tough I really like I had thought about it the night before like um I was like trying to think okay so how would I deal with the pagan raiders and your ability when I get your warrior four packs you know uh, eight pack down to four and then you can when I go to hammer them you can flip it drop your armor and your four packs throwing eight so it's like. There's no easy way for me to clean up your wounded units. There's no easy way to like, you know, uh, grab up my points. I just felt like it was like uh, almost like mutt versus mutt, very bloody. And yeah. I just I couldn't puzzle out what to do. And I, I also stumbled when I was planning to run down that left flank. I thought Hijra would give me the speed to get in the corner quicker than you. And what I didn't account for was between vivacity and sometimes you're doing double move uh, fatigue free charges up board. And then the last thing is once you kind of cleared out my end of the board, you were using maneuvers. So I didn't account for that. Between maneuvers and vivacity, I had miscounted your dice and your ability to get in those corners. And I watched you and I was just like, oh, shoot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had a lot of ground to cover, but you did Vivacity it. Vivacity and maneuvers. Yeah. Spending, it wasn't really costing me. I could still kind of keep up the pressure on you. And these guys are just maneuvering off in a way. So, yeah, it would have been interesting to see how the game went if you had put down terrain. And it would have been I different. I was the first player. It, it very, would have been, been a very different, different game, for sure. <laughs> and I would have put a steep hill in your back line. So let's just yeah. start there. Yeah. Camp. All right. So... Going into round three. Now, this one was the hostage scenario. So this one is a little, a little wild, a little crazy, can be. It's basically, it's similar to ambush. All your forces are moving onto the table, but instead of trying to attack a baggage to turn it into an objective, you're trying to capture an objective to turn it into a baggage, you know, like your baggage, and then you want to get that guy, you know, your hostage, just scamper off. So who are you playing round three here, Money? I was playing Zach and his Ordenstadt, his lovely, lovely Ordenstadt army. Oh, cool. So another kind of, you know, people would say, you know, Ordenstadt, it could be Mutt Light, you know, <laughs> it's the sacrificial right? abilities. That's true. Uh, so how did this one go? Were you... Yeah, so what was your uh, bodyguard unit that you put the objective in to start the game? Right. So I I struggled with this one a little bit, and, and my struggle started from here. Um, I think it's turn two. The hostage holding unit can start moving backwards. And mm -hmm. if both players, like as I kind of game this out of my mind, if both players really want to protect the hostage over everything else, like they put a swamp in their back and they hop the hostage unit into the swamp or hardcover or whatever. I was like, I was, I was struggling to think, how do I get my guys onto the board across the center line into the hostage holding unit quick enough before the hostage holding unit gets away? So, so one of my things was I didn't want to make my hostage holding unit too strong because then they're locked up. Sure, they can rebut the attacks, but I can't. I, those are those are figures that are taken out of my hammer. So mm -hmm. I think I went with like a nine man unit, and I think Zach went with a 12, uh, 12 warrior unit. 12. <laughs> yeah, big yeah. big hammer right there. Yeah, so it sort of depended on if you could make an early play because if you had a unit of cavalry or even your warlord, you could move onto the table and charge it first turn, and your warlord is probably as long as he kills a guy, the hostage is freed. On the first turn, you know, your warlord is exhausted next to probably the entire enemy army. Uh, <laughs> right. So it's probably not wise, but any mounted warband could have freed the warlord on the first turn if if they had the cojones uh, to do it with their warlord. Um, so obviously most players aren't going to do that. But if, right. if somebody chose a four pack of warriors, then you're like, hmm, maybe hmm. I will double activate my hearth guard. And if I do a six man or whatever, you know, I'll lose a couple, but it'll be freed. Um, so, yeah, you went a little, little juicier. So the frequently will happen that if if two players kind of load up that hostage, then it kind of just turns into kind of like a running battle. You guys are moving on, you know, looking for opportunities. So how did that the game develop 
Right. So um, because he because he had crossbow, I was nervous. Crossbow are really bad for my camels and my uh, horse mounted hearth guard. Um, but I also knew I needed the speed. So I put my uh, warlord on a camel. I put uh, my four pack of camel hearth guards and a four pack of horses out just for the saga dice and also the camel for the cheeky bloodbath play against his own mm -hmm. uh, mounted hearth guard. And I kind of pushed them up aggressively because I needed to. And Zach turned around and fearlessly just shoved his mounted uh, hearth guard right downfield, right in my face. <laughs> and I looked at it. I'm like, holy hell. I, I like I wanted to go chase his hostage holding unit and kind of deal with that. And I'm like, nope. I have this other threat. I've got crossbow over here. I've got knights that have come down. And for whatever reason, the kind of combo of trying to keep my board a little defensive to protect my own hostage, I kind of went into one of his knight units uh, with my camels, like Ra Saga, figuring, oh, well, we're camels. We'll give a minus one, and I'll just make yeah. my throws. And when we're Still all done— the advantage, yeah. Yeah, it didn't turn out. It was Ra Saga <laughs> didn't work even with camels. I like had one camel left, and he retreated. And I'm like, that is a bad opening. Oh. oh, what have I done? And so I was sweating. I was sweating from the hop. And Zach was just very aggressive. He was just fearlessly, you know, his crossbow moving up. He's just like, I'm like, this This was just a, a fur ball. To be honest, I actually, I think I got so stressed, I can't remember, like, where it started breaking for me. But little by little, um, once I started, you know, playing my board, using all my dice and kind of focusing on one unit at a time, I was kind of getting some breaks. I was starting to bend it back my way. And I want to say the game ended with like kind of the coolest, funniest thing. Um, you know, Zach's going out swinging. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of casualties. His warlord has one fatigue on him and he's within charge range of my uh, camel mounted warlord. All right. All right. right? Yeah. And he goes, uh, I'm uh, activating for a charge. And I looked at him like I could short move him. And I'm like, screw it. Come on in. We'll try the camel trick again. Mm -hmm. And that time the camel trick worked. I was exhausted. That wasn't great, but I did drop his warlord. So, uh, Ooh, but I mean, God. credit just going right in on that camel mounted uh, heathen bugger. And he, he almost got me. We almost had a mutual <laughs> shirt from there. Yeah, you can get some, some good mojo going by, by being aggressive for sure with the dice. Awesome. So did you scoop the, the hostage in the end for your I boy? Or? It was late in the game. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think he got a charge on my hostage one because there was so much swirling fighting on the left and right flank and his crossbows were giving me hell. Um, so finally, late game, um, his unit with the hostages has taken some hits. He's still holding onto it. And I finally pried it out of his hand very late. That was just oh. before his warlord went roaring in. Awesome. Well, good to hear. Yeah. Not many people were able to get that hostage, but... Yeah, it's just kind of, you have to see how the battle develops and see if there's a late, late turn opportunity, typically. Right. You can sneak in and, and, and free it. Right, and credit to Zach. Like, like there was a point where, like, when he wasn't moving his hostage unit back, I wasn't moving mine back. I think there was one turn where he did, so I did, and then we both stopped. We stopped trying to... So he was playing it in a way where, like, he's leaving his where I can get it, so I left mine where he could get it. Yeah, it takes resources yeah. to, to move him back, to rest him on, you know, yeah. whatever. Um, so if you can just leave the hostage unit, you know, if you've got an extra die to, to go ahead and do whatever with. Exactly. Uh, my game was against Triple T, Top Table Tom, and uh, he, he, was doing, he was doing well. So we played a couple games. So he's running Byzantines again. So I got both nice. Byzantine players in my <laughs> short stint in the tournament. You're welcome, everyone. And we had played a couple games uh, with his Byzantines. And so he, he's gotten pretty good. I, I think he really improved from those games. And funny enough, the last game we played, we did a test of the hostage scenario with his Byzantines <laughs> versus my Pagan Raiders. So if you play me in a scenario for Fimble Winter before Fimble Winter, it's guaranteed you'll be playing me in that actual scenario. <laughs> so this one, I was at... Uh, you know, going in around three, I've been running the event. I've been playing. Energy's low. I was pretty much set on just playing out a draw, not really doing, going for anything and kind of just letting it 
play out. Like I said, you know, if it's a draw, you know, the game's quick, it's over. I, I can get back to running the event. That's fine. Uh, but unfortunately, Tom, he wasn't going to let me sit back and have that draw. He charged out with a uh, second, third turn, something like that. A little four pack of Hearth Guard. Uh, just went in, he used that plus one armor ability and managed to kill five warriors. So he put him up. He was winning from then on. I didn't kill any. And then he was able, he had his dice loaded up. He was able to retreat him back to his line. And then I was like, ah, gosh darn it. Now, now I got to play a game of Saga. <laughs> Why'd you do this to me, Tom? <laughs> so most of this game was, uh, he had two units of levy, sword, and board. Never engaged those. I had no desire to ever fight those things. He had a unit of archers on each flank. So one was on the some steep ground or something. Never really got in the game. And so most of my army was moving over. And it took almost my entire army to kill his warlord, the hearthguard unit, and the um, like a 12-pack of levy. So I was down. And I was throwing everything. It just wasn't working. He was playing well. You know, I was just charging. I had to just charge because other, he could use that ability to just, you know, if I move first, he can remove the fatigue. So I'm like, I just got to go, you know. I'm fatigued. You're fatigued. Let's just keep fighting. So uh, he was doing a great job using his abilities. And, you know, it's tough it's busting through those yes. those levees. And uh, he was doing some some good damage. My hostage unit was the heavy weapons, hearth guard. And so they just hung back. They never got in the game. He had four hearth guard on foot for his, and they've been moving back. So the advantage of pressing the attack is, you know, I can be in a position to potentially go for that hostage unit. And so on the, the last turn, I send my warlord in there and I just kill one, you know, just kill one. I survive, so I free the hostage. But now my warlord, he's got two fatigues. The hostage has two fatigues. Tom's got one more turn. If he can, um, even with uh, having my hostage free, it's like a four-point swing, uh, having the hostage versus not. So I was getting eight bonus points. So even with that, I was just barely winning. I was winning by three. So if you had taken out my warlord or recaptured the hostage, it would have been either a win or a, you know, a win if you could do both. Uh, but he... That last turn is is Mojo left left him. They couldn't couldn't beg that warlord. Tried to shoot him. <laughs> tried to attack him. Just kind of bounced off a couple of times. I was exhausted. End of the game. So uh, wow. ended up being a, a slight victory for the the pagan raiders in the end. Wow. And managed to free that hostage. So uh, it was a pretty pretty wild. Battle, very, yeah. very hard fought. Probably the closest one I've had against Tom for a really long time. So nicely done, uh, Tom. He was playing well. Yeah, he had a, he had two wins to to meet me at the at yep. that table. So he was doing well. Uh, unfortunately, that was the end of my Fimble Winter journey. So the next day we had a drop. So I was the the man out. I had to drop as well. So going into round four. Monty, you are up against Adam Trunzo, mm -hmm. and he was running the Baltic Crusaders. Baltic Crusaders, yep. Yeah, so I have a picture up here. It's not of this particular game, but it's, it's showing off Scott's lovely Crusaders, and mm -hmm. it shows you what the walls look like. Yep. We've got two gaps, and Monty, you know, at this point, you get, you know you guys are the, the top two contenders already, I, I think. Um, so how, what was your approach for this game? So, so for a number of reasons, I did not get to prep for Fimble Winter like I like to do, like drill down, play all the scenarios multiple times. I did not get to play this scenario, but I had in my mind an idea that I think was pretty solid. I think it would have worked in most of my matchups. Uh, but as we'll see, it did not work in this particular one. <laughs> so, right, so my first thought, um, if, if you've ever seen this scenario, is if you get up on the wall, each unit that goes up on the wall rolls a D6 for each figure. Each one is a figure dies. So and when you come off the wall, right, a one kills, you roll a die for each figure, and again, a one kills a figure. So you're like... Yes, so this is essentially the... 
I don't remember exactly what it's called, the river or the yep, crossing frozen from river. Age of Invasions. Yep. Frozen River, yeah. yeah. So you have to get to the other side of the table. If you don't, those guys are dead. You can cross through the gaps where there's no terrain penalty. You can just move right through. So there's one on each side. Like the Frozen River, you can cross. It takes two tries to cross. And each time you roll a D6 on a one, your unit takes a casualty. You have to do that twice to get fully across. So, you know, basically one out of every three guys crossing is gonna, gonna be kaput, you know, like the original scenario. Mm -hmm. um, the difference with this one, you know, the thickness is half as wide, so the movement penalty goes from short to very short. And the difference is if you're on the wall, it counts as solid cover. So um, did that come into play, Monty? Any shenanigans it, it trying to use did, the wall? It did in retrospect. I came up with um, on the drive home an alternate strategy. But again, remember, I was working with the theory crafting in my yeah, head. Yeah, yeah. And here's my theory. And it seemed like such a damn good idea because I've kind of done this before in the objective type scenario. So B player one. Um, okay, I should explain. So you need to get the wall. The wall's the middle of the table. Each mm -hmm. army deploys M in. So my army is foot-based, and uh, it's all foot-based because he has two points of crossbow over there. And I realized, right, one point of crossbow oh. against Zach was bad. Two points of levy yeah. crossbow. So was even though he had mounted hearth guard, right, and, you know, the camels like that, he still yeah. wasn't. I I didn't. Everyone enough. on foot, and and the mm. reason I. It's like the most safe and conservative mutt build, and it lets you, everyone can close ranks, everyone saves better to shooting. It's super safe and cautious, right? Mm -hmm. So anyways, the thought was, building off that, was to, as player one, maneuver my whole force uh, out of my starting line, forward six, Hijra, we obey, and a determination, and I basically get my whole army up to the wall, both getting to the gap, immediately and then number two denying my opponent any chance to maneuver right mm -hmm. seems like a good idea does it yeah, does it seem like a good idea Raj? Good. so here's where it fall apart immediately i put up fanaticism um forcing my opponent to re-roll his sixes and in fact he re-rolls his fives and sixes because he's a crossbow with his ability um shoot the one that gives him three dice or five dice or is it four it's six? four chink four in the six. armor gives you four chink dice in the armor. Thank and you, you already the penalties you reroll sixes, but you know, right. if, if Monty's ability is already doing that, you know, it's not right. much of a penalty. Exactly. It wasn't much of a penalty. It just lets me reroll my ones on my saves, right? So I confidently am up on the wall. He moves up both his crossbow units, starts shooting, and my guys start dropping like flies. The, the rerolls <laughs> are not saving me. I lost like two half guard out of a four pack. I lost um, four or five warriors and one sweeping hellish round of shooting. Ba, 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 ba. And my, my whole right flank, that was them. There was a big a warrior pack and a, and a hearth guard pack, and boom, they're already like dust. So those guys had to use Saga Dice and cower behind the wall for the rest of the game. I couldn't even, <laughs> couldn't even push on that flank anymore. So um, I'm realizing like, oh, holy hell, crossbow, even with re-rolls, re is just brutal. And, and fanaticism is not saving me. I'm not rolling ones. Um, I just, I'm just kind of like, I, I don't know exactly what to do. I give Adam like every credit here because he is using, like you were using vivacity, the, the crusaders in the bottom, right? Oh, come on. Yeah, God's host. Thank you. God's or, host. Yeah. Um, he's using it to either pull his crossbow unit back out of charge range when he sees I have it queued or like a ship. He'll pull a half guard unit um, in front of them and space them between me and the and the crossbow unit. So I'm sitting there and we're both playing the paper game. He could see my board, I could see his. I can I know like what he I can charge 12 inches. So if he could shoot me, I can get him, but I can't quite get him because he keeps, you know, he keeps playing the game and he's playing it so tight. And yeah. tick, tick tock, tick tock, figures are dying. I look off to my to my left. And there's like a third of my warband and it keeps growing to crossbow fire because I'm kind of hunkered around and trying to get ready to make that turn five rush through the gap. And I just don't I just don't have a plan. I haven't really thought of this. I'm not making my save. So like my desperate 
like just little moves of desperation. I pushed my archer. I had a small archer unit of warriors. I pushed them up on the wall. Some die. When they get up on the wall, like now I can shoot at his hearth guard. But right away, he's a smart guy. He moves all his hearth guard away. And then I'm up on the wall and he starts shooting them in hard cover. And, you know, <laughs> some of them die. And I'm like, good God, this is just not going well. So my very last play was I had a rare and promise of paradise. I ran the archers off the wall and put them as a screen between one of his two crossbow units and just dared them to shoot him or melee. Yeah, I think that's brilliant. Right. Yeah. So he left them alone and they, they did their job. Like they were a screen. They reduced the shooting by half. Um, he wouldn't kill them, sadly for me. I never got to pop Promise of Paradise. <laughs> and turn five comes. I think it's a five turn game. Is that right? Five turn game. It's maybe. five and it, it can be six. If okay. You, okay. If you roll the die, That's it. You know? So we were guessing it might be five. So I rush everyone through the gap. I position them very carefully and uh, he rushes through the gap. And the craziest thing, Raj, you saw it with your own eyes. So, so I would say, I would say the great shame as the uh, mutt war, war uh, warlord here is that when, when you came by and you looked at our game, when it was uh, turn five, you saw probably 40% of my warband has been shot off the table, not a single melee death. They're all crossbow deaths. You look on his side, and I haven't killed a single figure of his, not a single figure. And I've we were doing the math. We're counting who went through, which units died. And when we're all done, it's a tie. And that was the hardest earned and most sweat-inducing tie I've ever, uh, I've ever experienced. Yeah. It's so crazy. You know, you could look at it e either way, you know, a moment <laughs> right. of shame or a moment of glory where you didn't kill a single model, but somehow you, you came out with the draw. Exactly. Um, yeah, there was an interesting dynamic going on where it was basically clear Adam had no intention of ever getting the crossbow levy to the other side. So, you know, you could engage them to get them to stop shooting you, but... Yep. They're, they're already dead from yes. Adam's perspective. And 100%. if he can take down anything, if he can fatigue you up and then counter charge, and, you know, so it was tough to unravel how you were going to gonna do that. <laughs> you, you know, so uh, it makes sense why you didn't end up killing anything. But I think we were there. If it looked like if it went another turn, you had an opportunity for potentially to bloodbath one of his units that made it across. Right. And right. you know, I, he I, would have more crossbow shots maybe to counteract, you know, in exactly. the end it might have been another draw. But it's so hard to say. But I, I had my eye like when he brought his troops to the table and he made a six pack of mounted hearth guard. In my mind, I was like, OK, baby, first chance bloodbath. Yeah, I'm going to yeah, go yeah. get him. And I mean, again, credit Adam. He is so skillfully. He's just he's he can see you're, you're pre measuring in Saga. So he's making sure everything is like outside of like a long charge and a, and a second charge. And he's just got it all precise. It was just when he rushed through the gap, I had a hearth guard figure and I had bloodbath ready. And I was like, and I was going to do with one figure. If you put one in the combat pool, you can feed bloodbath and you can make him bounce, you know, the hits back on himself. But eh. It was it was a tie, and honestly, I was a little I was a little relieved given what a bashing I got from those crossbows. Yeah, you're just getting oh gosh, it all game. No, you know. and and I I know we're under time, so I'll be real quick. But here's the thing, you know, when you when you don't when you don't practice. Now, granted, you can't think of everything, right? And and mm -hmm. part of the fun of a puzzle is to solve it in real time. But on the drive back, I was just trying to think, like, how how should I have come to this? Yeah, and I realized, Raj, your thoughts I there. should have done the same thing I did, except don't go to the gaps, go to the wall, hop up on the damn wall, because I assure you, I will lose less figures hopping all my units on the wall <laughs> and rolling ones, then I lost to his crossbow fire. And with every unit up on the wall, like, sure, go ahead, shoot me, give me hardcover and all the benefits and my re-rolls on ones with fanaticism. Yeah, blocking on threes, re-rolling ones. Exactly. Oh, the twos. Dude, I didn't see it in real time. I had told myself, like, over and over again, do not go on the wall. Do not go on the wall. The wall is where you lose. And here, I actually heard someone behind me. It was so funny, like, in real time, when you're like, you have a plan. And, and I heard um, behind me was Brent and I think Tom. Brent and Tom, yeah, Byzantine right. so Civil Byzantines. War. And I could 
can hear him yell up on the wall, up on the wall. And I'm like, what the <laughs> hell are they doing? The wall is deaf. <laughs> but, yeah. but no, there is a plan for getting up on the wall. It, yeah. Work for, for Brent. Yeah. He got up on the walls in that game and he, he won the game in the end. Nice. Uh, so with the, the Byzantine civil, so we'll put down as general. We decided, <laughs> uh, you know, over on that one. So, um, yeah, it was really fun. I was popping over kind of watching quite, quite a bit of this game. It was really interesting to see how things were, were developing or, or, or not or developing. Not. So, uh, yeah, good, good game. Good scenario. We're definitely going to be using these walls. Beautiful uh, walls. Again again. Gorgeous. So, uh, get ready, get ready people. All right. Round five, Monty. So you had a uh, win, two wins, yeah. draw. Just a little little baby loss yeah. to, to Raj here. So uh, you were actually still still in contention with all the bonus points and the uh, objectives and stuff you were grabbing. So nice. you were on that. The Adam moved on to the top table yep. against Scott. Yep. Now it's funny because he already beat Scott <laughs> twice <laughs> earlier in the event because he played him during the event round three. So with sixteen players, five rounds. The last one, you know, you can play somebody you already played, mm. and they played Age of Chivalry on oh. uh, at night. It was Adam versus Scott, and I think Adam schmuckered him, knocked him around <laughs> for that one as well. Nice. So you were on table two, and it was anybody's game based off. Uh, the the points so there's just a couple points different and the difference you could have a huge win worth six points and you could just have a regular win versus three so you know depend you could see you know there's a there's a path there Monty but you were lined up against Stephen Hollowell right uh, one of your Fellows in your yep. alliance of uh, Muslim forces right. he was playing Mutatawiyah so mirror match. Yeah, and this one was the uh, table quarters scenario. There was a little fence in the middle using the actual obstacle rules. So it was kind of like light cover, solid cover. And Monty, I think I saw the archers yes. were, were brought out once again. I had a plan. So any yeah. scenario that has a wall on it is basically going to be a good scenario for the, the mutt archers. Is, that, is that what you're saying? 100% was my plan. So, so I, I don't know if Steve was, uh, like doing the, uh, like a uh, game within a game or messing with me, but as we're sitting down before we go to bidding, he goes, boy, that first player has a lot of advantages. And so I had planned to be player one because I wanted the fence and I wanted to put my small archer unit in the fence to give them mm -hmm. that solid cover and then use their little threat, even though it's not a big fat, you know, unit, it's just that little bit of the shooting threat to kind of help keep the middle under control. And so like having heard him say like, you know, a little comment about how good player one has it. I did something I never do. I bid two points two to be points, player one. Money. And then he, he revealed he bid zero. And I'm like, oh, God, I've oh. just screwed myself. This oh, he's messing good. with you. Yeah, I think he if was. If he thought that, he would have bid one. <laughs> he would have, right? <laughs> <laughs> all right we'll see if this comes back to haunt you right as, as so many bids seem to do yes it's true and i never i can't think of a time i've ever bid two so i got a little i got a little too excited there but i did get the fence i did like as player one i got right i mean the advantages as player one is you need to get right up into the zones i got my archers right behind the fence got my warlord and some harp guard in one of the zones and so actually, as player one in this scenario, the pressure moves to player two, because if he doesn't get into my zones where I'm going to score points in, on my turn two as player one, I'm going to start with some bonus points. Mm -hmm. yep. And that's, in fact, what happened. And also, I'd say he had three points of camel. And the archers just really put him off for, like, throwing stuff into the oh, middle. Like, they yeah, kind of he... did the trick. That's cool. Well... What was going on with that? There was a, a big patch of solid cover. You both had units in there. <laughs> and I, I'm guessing he probably, on either player's turn, fanaticism would be up. So nobody wanted to charge the other guy. No. But I did get to see Steven was uh, a la Akbaring <laughs> to get was... through the, 
the the walls of uh, flesh there. Were were you Allah Akbaring back, or were you just um, taking it? What I, was going I on wasn't. There? I was letting him Allah Akbar. I was kind of. I was trying to slowly. It's hard in a mirror match, right? Like there's no mm -hmm. tricks I can break out on him. And like you said, he's playing fanaticism in his turn. You know, in my turn, then I'm doing it back to him. So that's kind of flattening the hammer blows. Um, and you're right. We did each rush into that hard cover. I did it because he was trying to sneak his archer unit up there to help contest and oh, control yeah, the middle. Oh, yeah, a little shootout. Right. So I rushed my guys up there, I think even maybe on a double move. I may have even used a hijra to get up there fatigue-free. So I got my warriors in there so that now his archers don't have anything to shoot at. So his warriors were between the archers. The archers sat in the back. I don't know if they got to shoot at all in the game. So that's kind of what I was going for. I kind of, like by getting my warriors into the hardcover, I, I kind of took the uh, took them out of the game. And and he didn't want to fight me in there, right? I didn't want to fight him. So he was just going mad with all the Akbar. He had a lot of uncommons. And it was, seemed like my memory is pretty much he'd kill a guy, he'd take a guy. He'd kill a guy, he'd take a guy. So Yeah, I never... Right. I watched quite a few of them because it's, it's really right. fun to, to right. watch that role. But right. you can see how, you know, if you could bag three with yes. one, all of it, you know, it's like a game changer. You know, let me just see, you know, and you're just fishing for luck yep. at that point just to see if you can kind of turn the tide or a little bit. You can imagine, you know, if you got three and then two, it's like your nine man unit is down to four or something. Then, it, you know, something could happen. But, you know, he's just rolling, rolling average mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, wasn't busting through the, the the lock there so yeah kind of a tough match for sure to try to score huge or big right, with the, right. the fanaticism so you had to kill the other guy's warlord and keep yours alive yeah so he kept his well he sheltered with with that, uh yeah. right with three points of hearth guard like he was always um had lots of meat shields um, I got one camel unit, I got another camel unit, but he kept the other camel unit by his warlord and skirted it behind the hardcover. So it was like a triple move away. Never really, you know, never really had a good shot on it. So, um, you know, it was, it was tough. It was good. Um, I would say like the plan I had, like, thankfully, cause I had played this exactly one time. Like I had a plan. I think the plan worked and, um, and once I got up a little bit, I think it started creating that pressure. And then when you start feeling the pressure, like it helped me get up a little more and a little bit more. And then the Allah Akbar came out. Sure. Yeah. Start making them a little, little riskier. Maybe. Right. You know, exactly. Like, well, you know, I could, I could bring it back, you know. If, right. I wouldn't do this normally, but I'll, I'll do it this time, you know. Exactly. Maybe, you know, maybe I'll get lucky. So awesome. Yeah. So tough one to try to get that big blowout. But I think it, it was a victory in the end, I believe. Correct. Yep. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So I think you got a three on that one out of a potential six. So just a, just a victory. No bells and whistles. Um, so you didn't know what was going on, probably. But Adam, he just he, he did win against Scott, but it was just a three with no bells and whistles. Okay. So if, if somehow yeah, the dice guys are on your side, there, there was a chance there. But as it turned out, you ended up in second place Bonnie. that's a good place to be that's Put a good place together. to be yeah right especially with a with a like a, a loss and a tie like i really if if you want to if you want to get in that top spot you need to not have one of those two things in there so honestly in the last game i knew i needed a win to have a prayer and i knew i needed all the bonus points i could get you go hunting points and then you just wait and see what the announcement is so second place is awesome yeah. Now, were you in second last year too? Uh, no, I think I, think I ended up. Scored, yeah, I scored think, highly. I'm. I think I might have fallen to fourth because that was the crazy year. I actually was up by nine points, and the guy rolled out of his head and like pulled us back to a tie, fighting me mm. out of hardcover okay. with saves of two plus, no three plus, because I was the picks. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. yeah, but no, no, all good. Okay, cool. Yeah, you did well last year. You were like. Table two again last year. So you're always, you're always in contention in the, these larger events. Yeah, that's one of the great things about five games. You can take a, get a little bloody nose, but right. you pick yourself back up and get right back into it. So, yeah, well done with the uh, action. Many people say lacks the, <laughs> the guts to, to make, make the long haul. Um, so over the course of the, the the weekend here did your style change at all you're kind of being less 
uh, judish or more ju- yes whatever judicious means whatever you're killing less guys <laughs> you were 100 percent right <laughs> i actually like i had a few tune-up games and tabletop simulator i had some good um, results against good players i felt very confident um it's complicated right it is a game of dice um i think you know there were a couple things i was doing very regularly that i was not doing as a prior mutt player um, I was putting up fanaticism first thing. It's expensive as hell, um, and it's harder to do as the game goes by. And invariably, there'll be a turn when you can't roll an uncommon, and then you're done. Like, that's a turn you're not going to have fanaticism. But those re-rolls, like, at times, they're just demoralizing for your opponent. Like, in my first game with Terry, he was throwing loads of sixes, and then he was picking them up and re-rolling them, and they weren't hits. And that yeah. just happens turn after turn it's after turn. It's funny. Just, it's yeah, you see the impact of it. And it really is demoralizing when, you know, Monty rolls the one to save and, yeah, oh, yeah, let me pick it up. Makes the save. <laughs> uh, in a way that, like, I don't know, when I do the Carthaginians with their rerolls, it never seems to be as impactful as the <laughs> fanaticism. Right. Uh, so, um, yeah, just those sixes. Going on, yeah, a couple hits here, a couple, just every, it takes the edge off everything. Right. So that is uh, pretty cool. Um, Yeah, I had a blast with the Pagan Raiders. I would say this is the most difficult incarnation to play for sure. So last year, I got a couple games in as the Saxons. I did the Germanic peoples at Adepticon, did very well with them there, took home the glory. Now this Pagan Raiders with the javelins, the heavy weapons, I like the javelin options, the heavy weapons really hurt some of the abilities on the board here. Um, So real quick, Profanation didn't use it except in the game three against Tom just to force him to use one of his defensive Byzantine abilities to get it out of the way so I could um, use it or attack his hearth guard later. Um, otherwise, I'd get a fatigue on him by beating up his levy. Placable, never got a chance to use it. Never felt like I had the dice. Ferocious, I did use a few times. Jeers, used that one against the Byzantines a couple times. Shield and Sayax, never used. Insignificant and Warcry, you have to have higher armor probably got to use them once each the entire tournament uh what was money was vivacity so just everything being on foot i just got really good at using that and there's some tricks you can do with the um javelins you know you shoot medium so you can move up shoot and then move away and especially using two units in conjunction that's something that i never really did before and Monty, you see, you know, just covering up holes. You know, looks like there's something weak for for Monty to attack, and they switch spots. You know, the fresh unit is in front, and the weak guys fatigued are behind. So that right. was money. Is is it okay if, as your opponent, I share just a moment on this because yeah, this is yeah. super. It's super. It. I would say, as a Saxon player, I never okay. When I'm Saxons, I use vivacity to just relentlessly push forward. So one trick pony, always forward, always getting ready for the next mm-hmm. charges, always relentlessly going forward. You used it for positional warfare and just really stymied me in our games. Uh, I remember one time your warlord went in to do something and he was exhausted. And I, I mean, if you heard me crack my knuckles, they, I was cracking them <laughs> in my mind. I'm like, I'm going to get that guy. That's what we're going to do. And then you proceeded to use Vivacity and you screened them and you moved. And I'm like, oh, come on. And I sat there and I stared and I stared and I stared. And I'm like, I do not have a beat on this guy anymore. And you kept doing that. Like you said, you would screen your beat up unit. You would screen your javelin boys before I could get to them. Um, In a way, um, credit, because it's what made me think of um, the same thing when Adam was doing it. He was doing the same thing of like, um, not using it to just do one thing, but kind of positional warfare, like knowing what's at risk, knowing what you need to protect, and then using vivacity to move your troops around just after my dice are set. And now I'm like, well, I can't do that anymore. 
Mm-hmm. Well done. Yeah, it, w- it was huge, like in every game. You know, popping in into terrain, popping out of terrain, you know. So you got the start of my next turn. I got a full run, you know, out of the terrain. So I was really careful throughout. Whenever I moved, you know, everything was... 4.1 inches, you know, unless I gauged in melee, that was the only time I ever got <laughs> with an S just to keep my options completely open and say, hmm, what's what's Tom up to? What's what's Monty trying to do here? And he's got a plan. Can I can I muck it up somehow mm-hmm. just based off his dice? Um, so that's something that I think maybe having the javelins. So I didn't need to necessarily engage. You know, I could still shoot some, you could still get stuff done. So maybe that's the difference between, you know, the Saxons, you know, if, if, if you're not charging, you're not, you're not killing. So, right. um, yeah, that, uh, really sharpened my vivacity game and really, you know, I liked the ability before, but in this, it was the key, like in all, all three games to, to keeping me in it. And then death is nothing got a lot more use. So just everything having one lower armor, the javelin guys, the sailors can go down to armor three, the hearth guards start out armor four. So, you know, when you have this, your opponent isn't gonna, you know, hit you as hard because of it. But if you're armor three, you know, they're gonna hit you pretty hard regardless. So being able to have this up was a little more juicier than it typically is. I don't necessarily use it that much. Um, and then the storm breaks always good, but mm-hmm. I barely used it during the entire tournament. Cause I was round one was hanging back round two against you. We didn't do a lot of fighting. Um, it was there. I, you know, I did use it once or twice with my warlord just to do kind of multi charges with him. Uh, I did use it against Tom in the last game. So I, I guess I did use it quite a bit, but, um, the, the rare would go to death is nothing first. And then the first horse would go to vivacity. Then if something was left over, I would go to storm breaks. So it's a very, very difficult in, in the land of the crusades guys on foot, uh, with, with no shooting defense <laughs> and heavy weapons. Yeah. Don't, don't, uh, don't go so far. I know Bob, he ran them. He didn't win a single game. At no point did he score 30 massacre. He never had more than 15 survival in any game. Um, he never got any bonus points in games one, two, three, or four. And the last game he killed Zach's warlord and kept his alive. So he had a little redemption. He got some bonus points. He ended the game with two, or ended the tournament with two points for for fame. But he had a really bad he, he had some bad luck too, but this is it was it wasn't it's not forgiving board <laughs> so no, no. glad i i played it um i think it's a good ringer board you know just throw it out there you know i wasn't super serious about everything and like i said you know i was okay if they don't want to fight you know I'll, I'll hang out and just wait for the game to be over and that'll be cool so glad i got to play them probably Got it out of my system, Monty. I don't think I'll be <laughs> running them again anytime soon. Maybe for battle report or something against Zach or something like that would be a good good option to showcase the skills. But um, overall, great event. So Wonderful. like we said, Adam beat Scott on the last table to take it. Uh, Chris Foreman, he got best... Painted. painted yep beautiful steve lesky got best sports nice and steve so he has come in last place the last two events so all of i think he only did two events so all of 2023 for him so coming out to 2024 he ended up coming in the top three um, after being rock bottom the last two events so he was gifted with the golden saga sticks nicely done Everybody got uh, shirts. Yep. Everybody bought them. Uh, these golden saga sticks were what I gave to the winner of the Warband Challenge. So Patrick down in St. Louis, he's got a set of these as well. My guy who does the laser cutting said they're very toxic to print. So these will be the last oh, golden no. saga sticks oh, no. uh, until 
find somebody else willing to risk life and limb <laughs> for uh, tabletop merchandise. All right. So uh, we had a blast and we're going to do it again next year. The date is not set. I've actually talked a little bit with the lady. It, it might be set sooner than later. Last year, we kind of had to wait for some bowling stuff to clear out. And this year, we might know a lot sooner. So people can lock that in. Okay. The All Fathers Tournament is on for June 15th. I'm not going to be releasing the pack for that until after Adepticon, but it's going to be Age of Magic and a team tournament with random partners. Glad to be getting back to this. I forgot that it's like the funnest event you can ever run, actually. <laughs> so uh, perfect for a little casual one-day thing. It's going to be at a local campground with uh, next to a little tourist spot with big rocks and rapids and high schoolers grinding their names into rocks and stuff. Monty, we could put it we can put a little M plus R in a heart there somewhere, you know, leave our mark. <laughs> okay, yes we can. <laughs> uh t- tentatively are you what do you so I don't know if you want this to be known, but I will congratulate you on your retirement. Yeah. So everybody thank you. Give give Monty a little thumbs up or a high five in the comments. So are you, you got big plans for, it sounds like you're going to Adepticon, but after right. that, are you going to be sticking around the area or anything um, like that, that you can say? We, um, so my wife will retire in June and we want to travel and we want to do a big driving vacation. Go see a lot of people that we just haven't seen over the years. Life is pretty busy. It's always revolves around our kids and that's fine. Like that's how we've chose it to be. But like now we'll have some time to do some things uh, we want to do. So that'll, that'll be us um, for the second half of the year. Glad to hear it. Well, hopefully we'll continue to see you at events and stuff. Yes, you will. uh, Any plans? Bonnie, are you quitting Saga Thursday on me? Oh, God, no. Be honest. All right. No, I would, all right. Yeah, no. All right. I'm going yeah, underground. Baby. Going underground. All right. So uh, that's awesome. Glad to hear. A couple things to wrap up here. We got the Saga Thursday Discord server. Head on over there. There are some pics of the event put up there. You can look at the scores. The tournament pack is in the files section. We've got the Saga Player Finder world map. Thanks to Art. Over in Russia, he was able to clarify that is not a joke pin, Monty. There's real people right. playing there. Yeah, so this, awesome. It was marked special place. I was a little suspect, <laughs> but Art sent me a photo, and it's a, a game club, and they have a banner here. Monty can't see, oh, but wow. the pick okay. is up. He sent me a pick. says, hello, Raj. So I think that's amazing. If anybody wants to send a pick of themselves... <laughs> In their game space, uh, at the club, whatever, with the Hello Raj, I will put it in a video 100% of the time. So if you want to be in a Saga Thursday video going forward, send me a pic. I like it. uh, Hello Raj. All right. Um, Going forward, Monty. So we are going to get another perspective on Fimble Winter Game 4. Adam. He has already recorded with oh, me the nice. Champion Speaks uh, tournament recap from his perspective. So we've got the winner of Saga Thursday. So that'll be out this week or next. After that, things are up in the air. Still trying to keep the Fimble Winter campaign going, one per month here with Zach. So that might be out. Otherwise, I've got a couple in the can here. I do want to thank... Saga Thursday patrons, Terry, Patrick, Sean, Mitchell, Scott, Frank, Britt, and DJ, and you too, Monty. Couldn't be doing it without you. This takes a, takes a lot out of a man creating this many <laughs> Saga videos, Monty. Yes, and it I does. I wouldn't be doing it without all the patrons. So thank you guys, and definitely consider heading on over to the Patreon. Link is below. There was some juicy tidbits revealed as far as chivalry and age of magic both i guess hmm. it's not good patreon ship i should have split the different months so people would have to have to uh subscribe two months instead of one (laughs) uh, there's a little tidbit on the hussites and the italians 
for chivalry in the first bonus video of the month and there's five the leap year money we got five thursdays in february so there was another bonus video where i talked a little bit about age of magic and people were able to ask me questions money did you watch that one mm, get a chance i might have missed that one a question is oh, about age of back. magic go back the welsh machine gun on the wagon hmm. oh be coming back yeah. baby <laughs> i love it yep i remember oh, him awesome well Hope you enjoyed this video, and I'm going to be seeing a lot of you at Adepticon real soon. Looking forward to it. Monty will be there. We'll be kicking butt, hopefully, oh, yeah. taking names. But if you have any thoughts about the tournament or anything we said, comment below. Love to hear from you folks. And I think that's going to be it. Monty, does it feel like that's it? I think that's it. Yeah, I think so. All right. I'm going to check you later, folks. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Saga! If you'd like to see more Saga content, consider joining the Heathen Army over on Patreon or popping on down to the Saga Doors Day Discord server. Links below. Thanks, guys.